Life is fragile. It's a fact we're learning in real time, every day. What we once called normal has seemingly disappeared. There's uncertainty in the air, restlessness in our hearts. Things we once took for granted are becoming difficult to find. Our usual day-to-day -day has evolved into this odd chaos. Peace is becoming obsolete. Many have lost jobs, security, and those they love. The pain is undeniable. But what if our fragility caused us to lean harder into God? What if in our weakness, we chose to rely more on His strength? Would our outlook change? Would the peace that passes understanding begin to drown out the noise of this moment? Would we walk in a quiet confidence, knowing our God is mighty to save? We're not promised tomorrow, but we are given a simple truth to stand on. Our God goes before us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Yes, life is fragile. But in our weakness, He is strong. Amen. Aren't you glad that in our weakness uh, that He is strong? It is, uh, it is good to see everybody, those of you that are watching online. Uh, we appreciate that. We had our 8.30 service this morning. And and uh, everybody that was here for that. So it is, uh, it is absolutely fantastic just to be able to be with you. If you got your Bible, I want you to turn over to, um, to Luke chapter 8. And uh, we're going to kind of pick up a little bit where we, uh, where we left off last week. And uh, I'm excited about it. There's a verse of scripture while you're turning over to Luke. In First Peter uh, chapter 3, in verse 15, it says this. It says, but in your heart. It says, set apart Christ as Lord. It says, always be willing to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the hope that you have in Christ. And then it ends with saying this. It says, do this in gentleness and love. Now, I love that verse. That's uh, when I was a youth pastor. In fact, one of the very, the very first youth group that I ever had was Cottage Hill Baptist Church, Pleasant Grove, Alabama over on the other side of the world. And uh, Jason, I think you probably know where I'm talking about over there. Jason Floyd's from that area. And, uh, but Cottage Hill Baptist Church, I was the youth pastor there starting in 1995. And uh, my very first trip that I took with a group of students there, uh, I designed a T-shirt. And on the back of that T-shirt, I had 1 Peter 3.15, but in your heart, set apart. It says Christ is Lord. Always be willing, it says, ready to give an answer to anybody who asks you about the hope that you have. Well, can I tell you something today? Outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ, you and I have no hope. Our hope is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Last week, I began a new sermon series called All Things New. It comes from uh, a verse of scripture where it says this. It says, therefore, if we are in Christ, we're a new creation. The old is gone, and behold, everything becomes new. Behold, all things are new. We started last week. We looked at a very interesting passage of scripture. And by the way, if you were not able to be here last week and you tried to watch it online, you probably got frustrated with what you saw online. There was some type of a glitch we had in our system and it was messed up. Um, I, and so what I did this past week for any of you, because I encourage you, any of you especially, if you struggle with anything from your past, I want you to go and I want you to watch last week's sermon. I, uh, you don't have to watch the messed up one. Uh, this past week, um, I sat in my office and I decided that we needed to get that, that message out. And so I preached that entire message in my office on a video and uh, we uploaded that this week. So it's going to look a little different, but I want you to watch that video because, um, or the sermon. And I think it's just, I think it's a message that you will need to hear, okay? Well, today we're going to continue on 
in this, this study of, of all things new. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about having a new hope. For you and I, when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you have what the world does not have. You have a hope for tomorrow. When I worked uh, as a clinical chaplain, I worked with, as a chaplain for St. Vincent's Health System for a number of years, and, and when I was in a room with someone, a, a lot of times as a chaplain, you spend a lot of times in rooms with people who are dying, and uh, it's not an easy part of the job, but it is a vital part of it, and so um, I would be in rooms with, with people who knew Jesus Christ, who their family knew Christ, and, and I'll tell you, the, the, uh, the difference between being in a situation like that and being in a family's room with someone who's passing who does not know Jesus Christ, I'll tell you the one word that I always said was the divider there, and that was hope. For those of us that are in Christ, we have a hope. We have a hope of tomorrow. We have a hope now. Now, the word hope that we have does not mean that uh, we're hoping something's going to take place. The word hope you have in, in Scripture means that you have an absolute confidence in God's Word, an absolute confidence in what God has for you. And so we have a hope that this lost world does not have. And so today I want us to look at a very uh, interesting passage of scripture. I've got to ask you to do me a favor. You've got to hang with me through the whole sermon, okay? Because you're going to say to me about 90% through the sermon that this is the most simple message ever. And it is. But I want you to hang with me because I want us to look at this, okay? If you got your Bible, uh, turn over to, uh, to Luke chapter 8, and we're going to begin reading in verse 40. And uh, I just want to read down through verse 42. If you'll stand to your feet out of reverence to God's word, it says this. Now this is, I'll just remind you, last week we left Jesus in the, in the, the village of the Gerasenes. That's where he healed the demon-possessed guy. And if you remember at the end of that, the people in the town told Jesus to leave. And the demon-possessed guy, remember, he got in the boat and said, hey, I want to go with you, and, and all of that. Well, now Jesus sails on, okay? And here's where it picks up. It says, now when Jesus returned, it said, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue, synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, it says, the crowds almost crushed him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we do love you and we praise you and we thank you for today. And we thank you, God, for the incredible privilege and joy that you've given us to be here. And Lord, today, as we take a look at how we can express the hope that we have in you. Lord, I pray that for all of those that are here and those that are watching online, Lord, and my prayer today is that you will bless in such a mighty way. Lord, may you be glorified through everything we do and say, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Let me set up the picture here because it, it's, it's, of, if, it's of importance for us to realize and understand what's going on. Jesus is at a point in time in his ministry where he is extremely popular. Now, he's not necessarily popular because they think he's the Messiah. He's popular because they're coming to him wanting to see miracles they're coming to him wanting to uh hear what he's going to say they're coming and so there's a lot of reasons that the crowds are, are crushing in on him as this passage of scripture talks about so this is one of those times jesus is there and uh um, a man by the name of Jairus. Now, there's a little bit that we know about Jairus from this passage of Scripture. We know that he is probably a religious person. Now, you can take that to mean whatever you want, okay? Um, religion will get you to church a lot of times, but it's a relationship that brings you to Christ. So, uh, when I'm sharing the gospel with people, especially those that are belligerent to the gospel, I will, uh, I will uh, in inevitably, one of the things they're going to try to tell you is they'll say, well, I'm not a religious person, and I throw them way off track because I'll look at them and say, that's awesome, I'm not a religious person either. And then I share with them the gospel, and I talk about how it's a relationship that I have through Jesus Christ. And so, but, but Jairus would have been a religious person, but obviously, in, when it came down to the point in his life, he was at a point where he seemed to have absolutely no hope. 
That was what he felt in his life. And I think every one of you could have gotten to that point. Now, I will share with you a little bit of information. Most of you know I have two girls. These two girls mean a lot to me. I love my two daughters. This is a very difficult week at the Mosley household. And I'll tell you, I'm asking you to pray for Brother Brad and for Miss Beth. And here's the reason why. Because on Friday of this week at 12 o'clock when Beth gets off work, we drive to Auburn. Four years ago, I drove to Auburn. I took my family down there, and I left one of my daughters down there, and I thought it, that was the hardest thing I think I've ever done in my life until this coming Friday when I drive to Auburn and I leave both of my girls down there. So I need you to be praying extra hard. It will be a very difficult ride home. I'll never forget when we dropped Megan off that first time. Beth and I, you know, I'm, I'm always pretty, pretty strong and, and everything. And so we get into the car and we're driving. And I mean, there's absolute silence on, uh, yeah, on, on just in the car. There's just absolutely nothing. And, and uh, so um, I, uh, I, I flip the radio on and I'm, I'm connected to it, to my Bluetooth. And, and uh, I play the song um, that's it's called Cinderella. I danced with Cinderella. Oh my goodness, it just, it was, it was a long road uh, trip home from there. You see, I love my girls. So I can't imagine being at a place where J. Iris is at. For you and I, the only time that, if your child is deathly ill, if your child is deathly on their deathbed, you're going to do everything that you can to stay with them. Do you agree with that? You're going to be right there by the bed. However, we find that this must have been, at least for Jairus, a seeming hopeless situation because he leaves the bedside of his dying little girl in order, in order to go to the only place that he knew, and that was at Jesus. And you know what was interesting? Last week, we found the demon-possessed man where? At the feet of Jesus. And this week, it says that this man with no hope runs and he finds himself at the feet of Jesus and, and he's pleading it says he says Jesus come to my house he said my little girl my little girl is dying now I want to I want to take a break in the story and I'm going to tell you a little bit okay right here is the place where I would expect everything to center in toward a little 12-year-old girl that is in a distant village dying. I would expect that Jesus would at that point in time say to his disciples, all right, clear the path, get everybody out of the way, we're going. And that's what Jairus thought. Jairus is there and Jairus starts to go and as he's going he turns and he looks back and you notice the last part of the verse we read a second ago it said the crowds begin to crush in onto Jesus well what happens next is a little bit amazing to me it's another story that you're very familiar with I just don't know if you realized where where it fell when it came to uh in, in this timeline it's the story of the lady who had the issue of blood, who ha had had this disease, and she wanted more than anything to be healed, and she was longing to get to Jesus. And, and remember, it says that she reached out and just touched the cloak of his garment, and, and, and Jesus turned and said, who touched me? And all the disciples said, what do you mean? There are hundreds of people that are crashing around you. People are touching you everywhere. And he said, no, somebody with faith touched me. I felt it. go out. And, and the lady said, it was me. And Jesus turns, and he heals this precious lady that was there, I had this disease, this issue of blood, and all of this, and all the crowds were amazed and everything, and, and something tells me that everybody in the crowd that day was in absolute amazement of what happened with this precious lady, except for one guy, and that would be Jairus. Because remember, Jairus was the one sitting there going, would you come on? My little girl is dying. Finally, I won't tell you the story, then I'll read you the story. Finally, we don't know how much time elapses in there, but I can tell you this, the Lord's timing is the perfect timing every time. It is. We don't get it, we don't understand it, but God's timing is absolutely perfect. Finally, they turn 
And Jesus says to Jairus, all righty, let's go. And as they turn to walk, Jairus looks out across the, the street, and coming down the road is one of his servants. And from the look on his face, he knows exactly what his servant's about to say. Before that servant ever gets there, Jairus is probably already down on his face. And his servant comes to him and says, you don't need to bother Jesus anymore. She's dead. Now, I want to tell you something. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have experienced the darkness that I'm talking about right now. They'd say that there's no, no pain that's any greater to a parent than to lose a child. It's tough. And J. Iris is there, and he's at a moment in his life when it seems to be every bit of his hope that we talked about a minute ago was gone. Jesus does something. I want to pick up the story. Flip over to, uh, we're going to start reading in verse 49. You see, verses, uh, verse 43 over through verse 48 tells the whole story of what happened in the middle. This whole story we talked about a second ago. Then we pick it up in verse 49. I want to read again. It says, when Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, your daughter's dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. But listen to verse 50. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe, and she will be healed. What did Jesus give Jairus at that moment? Jesus gave Jairus hope. In the midst of the darkest situation you could ever find yourself in, in, in the midst of the darkest moment in Jairus' life, Jesus speaks hope into him at that moment. He says to him in verse 50, he says, Here in this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe, and she'll be healed. In verse 51, when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, James, John, the child's father and mother. And meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead but asleep. But verse 53, they laughed at him knowing that she was dead. Oh my goodness, what a difficult and seeming hopeless situation. I'm not real certain what I would do. I don't know. Some of you have experienced exactly what we're talking about, and it, and it brings up pain, and I understand that, okay? Because I can, nothing, something tells me that J. Iris, there's a moment here that, 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 I don't, uh, that, that I don't even know that we realize, but there's a moment here because, remember, J. Iris had left the bed of his dying little girl to run and get Jesus. And he gets to Jesus, and finally they're making their way back. And then it says, as they got to the house, Jesus took three of his closest disciples, Peter, uh, James, and John, with him. But then it said this, and it says that there was a reuniting that took place between two parents. See that? It was a father and mother that came back together. There's a moment there that we don't have in Scripture that I can just tell you would have been a gut-wrenching moment but see Jesus knew what Jairus and his wife did not Jesus knew that the hope that he had spoken to Jairus in verse 50 was about to come to light and how it does it is an absolute incredible incredible picture there's an incredible miracle here now, I want to encourage you to do something because what you're about to hear me say is that very simple part of this passage of Scripture. The most simple part of this passage of Scripture. But remember, I ask you, don't, don't hop off the train yet, okay? Stay with me till we get to the end. Jesus, Peter, James, John, 
Jairus, his wife, walk into this little room where this little girl, this little 12-year-old girl is dead. Jesus closes the door. And Jesus turns to this little girl. And Scripture says, and you can read it, put the, put the next verse up there. Scripture says, in the next verse, it says that Jesus reaches out his hand. And he takes this little girl by the hand and he says to her, Child, get up. And Scripture says at that moment that that little girl stood up. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I think we just read through that and we miss the incredibleness of that moment. Okay? Something tells me that in that moment, Jesus goes in. There's a little girl. She's dead. She's 12 years old and she's dead. And Jesus reaches out his hand to this little girl. And it says that, that, that he begins to lift her up and says to her, uh, little girl, Tabitha, he says, stand up. And this little girl stood up. And Peter, James, and John are over there going, that's what I would have done. And Jairus has got his arms around his wife. And they're just squalling their eyes out. You know why? Because hope became real. It says that Jesus reached out his hand. He took the little girl by the hand and she stood up. Then Jesus said, go and get her something to eat. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because this little girl was hungry. In those days, they did something which many of you have heard before, okay? But when, <coughs> excuse me, I don't have COVID, I promise. But Jesus, uh, they did what many times that you've heard of. When you got sick, they believed and felt like that you had to starve that sickness. Now, this girl's a little 12-year-old girl. For her to get to the point and reach the point to where she has died, something tells me she had probably been through a sickness for quite some time. And throughout that time, she had not eaten much of anything. Jesus reaches out his hand, takes the little girl, tells her to get up. She stands up. He says, go get her something to eat. And the reason I believe for that is because I believe this little girl was hungry. Jesus said, feed this little girl. She's hungry. And then the next verse, the last verse we're going to cover today says this. And I think it, it gives us one of the, uh, one of the areas in Scripture uh, that probably, in my opinion, at least I would say, uh, is an understatement, okay? Because it says in that last verse there, it says, and her parents were astonished. It says, but he ordered them not to say anything to anybody. Let's think about this idea of the astonishment of a parent. I think that is a, probably an understatement. Why? Because they had gone from an absolute hopeless situation with their little 12-year-old girl who was dead. Jesus reaches out his hand, says to her, Tabitha, stand up. And the little girl stands up. He says to him, go and get this little girl something to eat because she's hungry. And she begins to eat. And then it just simply says, and the people were astonished. You know why? Because something quite impactful had just taken place. You know how I know that it was astonishing? And you know how I can tell you that it was an impactful thing? Because I'm 2,000 some odd, some odd years on the other side of this, and we're still telling this story. We're still hearing about this story. Hope was restored to a family. And I want to ask you, what is the evidence? I told you, it's simple. What is the evidence of this hope that had been restored? Well, I want to give you three answers to that. Jesus gets to the house of Jairus. He turns to Peter, James, and John and says, come in with me. He turns to Jairus, says, Jairus, get your wife. 
come in with me. They close the door. And they walk over. And Jesus takes his hand and he reaches out to this little girl and says, Tabitha, get up. And she stood up. I want to tell you the first evidence of a restoration of hope in her life was her stand. Can I tell you something today? We live in a society. Megan and I were traveling home from uh, from Auburn or somewhere the, uh, just yesterday or day before. Um, we were traveling home from the cabin. And uh, she and I got to talking, and she, she was talking about the things that we see in the world today. She was talking about all the rioting, all the unrest. She was talking about the suppression of the gospel. She was talking about all of these things. And, and she, she asked me, she, or she made a statement. She said, I think it's coming down to a point in time where we're going to actually suffer great persecution because we are Christians. Now, I will tell you uh, two reasons why I believe that that is a true statement. One is because I think we're seeing it, and two is because God's Word says it. We're going to suffer those types of, of, of disappointments. We're going to suffer those types of, of, of oppression that takes place. We're going to suffer. So, so we begin to talk, and she's like, you know, what are we going to do if it gets to the point where, where Christianity is, is, is illegal? What are we going to do if they say to us we have to close the doors of our churches if we don't succumb to this, this worldview, this postmodern worldview that's out there? What are we going to do if we don't, we don't give up and, and give up what God's word says what are we going to do if they look at us and say if you don't do this we're going to and they begin to persecute us well can I tell you what we're going to do we're going to do like that little girl we're going to stand to our feet and we're going to declare Jesus is Lord Paul's writing a letter to the church at Rome a place where there is so much unrest and everything that's going on. And there's all kinds of questions about what he's going to do. And he doesn't get far in his letter, uh, the, the letter to Romans. Romans 1 verse 16. In the midst of unrest, Paul says this, I am not ashamed, he said, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of it. Peter and John are walking through Jerusalem. Just after Jesus had been crucified, just after he had resurrected and ascended back to the Father at the very beginning, and they're sharing the gospel, and those that murdered Jesus come up to Peter and John and say, you're not to speak, we don't want to hear you speak in his name again. You're not to even utter the name of Jesus. Remember what they said? They said, you do whatever you feel like you got to do to us, we can't help but talk about him. We live in a world today that knows everything that we as Christians stand against. I could list you a million things that we stand against. And they're biblical things. And listen, I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't. Uh, there's so much that, that, that we just, in this world, that we cannot stand for. But can I tell you something? My fear is that this world has so focused on everything that we stand against that we have failed to proclaim who and what we stand for. And I stand for Jesus Christ. I sat in seminary 20-something years ago. And I'll never forget in the Old Testament, there's a phrase, there's a Hebrew phrase that you find over and over and over that was given to the prophets as they wrote. And it was called an oracle of Yahweh. In other words, it is defined every time you read through Scripture and it says the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. Well, I want to tell you something, folks. We've got to take a stand on thus saith the Lord. We've got to. There's a second. There's a second evidence of hope. The first one is your stand. Jesus goes into the room, reaches out his hand, takes the little girl, Tabitha, stand up. She stands up. Remember the next part? Jesus looks and says, go and get her something to eat. Why? Because she was hungry. The second evidence of the hope that you have in your life. The first is where you stand. The second is what you hunger 
for. They say that hunger is one of the most driving forces that you could ever imagine. They said people will go to any length they can to try to feed themselves. Hunger is one of those driving forces. You know, the truth is, many times we hunger after that which is not good for us. I stand here and look down at my belly and I go, yeah. I had somebody say to me one time, and I didn't have a defense for this one. They said to me, well, you know, all you Christians, you preach against, mm, 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 and they named these things. They said, when was the last time you preached about gluttony? I said, you realize I'm bigger than you, don't you? I didn't. I didn't. I thought it. I did. We hunger after that which does us no good. People that are addicted to things have addictive behaviors. You hunger after something to fill that addiction. You hunger after something to fill that void in your life. People that go from, from, uh, from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship are trying to fill a void. You have a hunger for something to be filled, a void to be filled in your life. People that go after drugs, they're hungering for something to take that void that is out of their life. Can I tell you something? What if we channeled that hunger into our relationship with Jesus Christ? What if just like an addict, an addict is longing and hungering for that next fix, what if you hungered, what if they hungered for God's word like that? Now let me ask a question. What if you and I did? First evidence of the hope we have is where we stand. The second evidence is where we hunger. But there's a third one, and we'll close with this. And Jonathan, you guys begin to come on up and play. There's a third evidence here. Jesus walks into the room. He shuts the door. He reaches out. He takes the little girl by the hand and says, get up. And the little girl stands up. That's her stand. He says to him, go and get her something to eat. That's her hunger. Do you remember the next couple of words? It says that her family was astonished. I think we could take that a little bit further. I bet Peter, James, and John were astonished. How about the people wailing on the other side of the door that had made fun of Jesus when, they, when Jesus told them what was going to happen? And they opened the door, and there comes this little girl. You think they were astonished? Yeah. For the hope that you have in your life, your stand, your hunger, but the third evidence of this is your impact. I'm 46 and a half years old. I don't know how many years I've got left. I have no idea. I was thinking the other day, for me to be middle-aged, I would have to be really, really old. <laughs> maybe I will. I don't know. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll live to a very old age. I don't know. Nobody's ever going to come to to uh, to my grave and say I was the best at much of anything. Nobody's going to say. I mean, my girls hopefully can come and say that I was the best daddy. I'm the only one they've ever had. But nobody's going to come and say that was the best preacher, best pastor. Hope somebody can say I was their best friend. None of my None of my former players are going to come up and say that's the best football coach I ever had. You know what? I'm okay with that. Because here's the thing that I have made my life determining toward. I just want to make an impact for Jesus. I don't care about the, the glory out of that. I just want to make an impact for Jesus. 
You say, what can I do? There's a husband and wife, and they were walking down a, a beach, and they were the only two on the beach. And the tide had come in, and then it was actually just making its way back out. And there all over the beach were tons and tons and tons and tons of starfish who had gotten caught when the tide went back out. And every one of those starfish were going to die. They, they have to have the water. They're walking along, and there's hundreds of them out there. And the fellow reaches down, and he gets one of the starfish, and he goes back over, and he puts it in the water. And the wife says, there's hundreds of them, honey. We can't make a difference. And he looked at her and said, I made a difference to that one. Folks, make a, take the hope that you have in Christ, the hope that this world is longing for. Make an impact for him. In a world that tells you that you can't be a Christian. In a world that tells you you can't live in a biblical worldview. In a world that tells you all of these things. You say, I stand for him. In a world that's hungering after alcohol. In a world that's hungering after drugs. In a world that's hungering after relationships. And hungering after fame. And hungering after all of this. You declare... I hunger for the Lord. In a world that will do everything they can. I, I, I'm, I'm firmly believe that we live in a world that will do everything it can to make the most negative impact possible. Every generation, every generation looks at the generation behind them and says, I don't even know. Hunter and I were talking the other day. He's got a little baby and a toddler. And he said, I don't know the world that my kids are going to be in. You know what we got to do, man? You got to train Luke and Emma Jane You got to train Jace. You got to train Daniel. You got to train that little boy that had a birthday a few weeks ago, Jackson. Jessica, you got to train her up. Y'all got to train up them two little ones. Y'all got two at your house. You got two at your house. You train them. You got to train Logan, Luke, and Kate. You train them to take a stand for God and to hunger after Him and to impact this world. Christ moms and dads I didn't leave Kenley out you got to train her up all of us we've got work to do we've got a lot of work to do I want to go back to the very first verse we started with That in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be willing to give an answer to anybody that asks you about the hope that you have. Do it in gentleness and love. My invitation today is going to be very simple. The question that I have for you is, where are you standing right now? What's your hunger? 
and probably the hardest one, what kind of impact are you making in the world that God puts you? We've got to stand for Christ and do everything we can. Those of you that are listening at home, I encourage you. Make a difference. Make a difference. We're looking around and we're saying we've got a world that is, that is suppressing us as Christians. Then stand up. And make a difference. If you're here this morning, you've never trusted in Jesus, you need him. In just a moment, we're going we're gonna to stand and we're going to begin to sing. I'm inviting you to come. We're not going to sing long, but I'm asking you to come. Maybe you're looking for a church home. God's called you to serve at First Baptist Moody. You come on. Maybe you just want to find a place at this altar. Listen, whatever you feel like you need to do, whatever God does in your life. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. And God, we fall before you right now as humbly as we know how. Lord, with a commitment today, a renewal of the hope that we have in you. Lord, as we stand for you, as we hunger for you, and Lord, as we make a commitment that we're going to impact this world. God, I love you. God, I thank you for the hope that we have. Lord, I pray you'll bless during this invitation time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.